Hey, welcome back, everybody. Okay, yes, yeah, so I guess um, we are at the point where we can go ahead and uh, hand it over to Dave. I'm going to read the abstract really quick so we can get some context, but the, uh, the title, Creating an AI Inventory and Roadmap for Your Org, an Interactive Choose Your Own Adventure Session. And the description, join us for a tour of Prepare AI's framework to identify and prioritize op opportunities for automation within your organization. We will use curated examples, our own war stories, audience polls, and the in-session hive mind to chart the course to automation success. Bring your ideas, your questions, and your organization's biggest challenges. And then just a little bit about Dave. Um, Dave Castanero is Chief Data Officer at Capacity, the AI-powered support automation platform, where he directs initiatives in data analytics and machine learning. He is also co-founder of Prepare AI, a nonprofit that is empowering an inclusive community of AI practitioners in the Midwest. His background is in engineering, neuroscience, and business, with 18 years in industry working with data and modeling. So from there, I'll hand it over to you, Dave. Great. Thank you so much, Anthony. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Excited to be here. Let me get my screen up to share and we can tag team on building, building out some AI wins. Um, cool. So uh, I've asked Anthony and Dan uh, to, to keep me posted if there's questions in the chat. I uh, would love if there's, uh, if it's participatory as we go. Uh, also, you'll know, feel free to, to jump in on the audio. Uh, I'll stop every every few slides every uh, now and then, and we can kind of discuss on things. Uh, but yeah, so uh, what I wanted to do here was we developed this framework at Prepare.ai, uh, hoping that we can we can just sit down with a company, you know, some some of the leaders in the company, some of the people direct, you know, putting together some AI initiatives. And go through and, and chart out at a high level a, a roadmap for what AI would look like. So let me just go through some of these slides here. Uh, we talked about prepare AI. We're working to improve the AI IQ of the region. Uh, so we've got events, education, collaboration. Uh, me and my uh, my colleague Fully Fully Teasdale. We host a podcast where we interview and talk to uh, you know people in the AI and data science space. Uh, so check us out at prepare.ai. You know, we were going to have another conference this year, but COVID is just throwing wrenches into the wheels. And uh, so we are not uh, doing a conference just, just yet, but stay tuned uh, for uh, upcoming events. Okay, what is an AI inventory? Simple stuff. It's just a list of possible opportunities that might add value through automation. Uh, so this is pretty neutral. What is an AI roadmap? This is where you start to put some rigor behind it, start to get some directionality. It's an organized framework to prioritize, evaluate, and implement those AI opportunities. So the high-level process that we have in this framework uh, is one, you list an inventory of all your business processes. So what are all the things that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis at, at your business? Uh, number two, Organize those processes by department, action type, dollar value. Get you know get get some some organizing hierarchy around that. And so I've, we've got some examples that we can we can show. Uh, number three, brainstorm automation opportunities for each process. And so I also have some examples here that we can walk through. And uh, this is where one of the spots where I'd love uh, people to to chime in uh, with your ideas, with your, your thoughts. Uh, number four. Estimate the return on investment. Uh, what are the possible potential benefits divided by the probable costs and effort? Uh, and also consider the risks of each automation opportunity. So we can talk about that more as well. Uh, then number five, brainstorm lightweight experiments for proof of concept. You just wanna focus on proving the concept. You don't have to build the spaceship immediately. You just build a, build a skateboard, just increment. You know, skateboard, car, scooter, truck, spaceship. Um, so when, you, when you're thinking about those lightweight experiments to prove a concept, 
you want to focus on the team, the tools, and the available data. Make sure that somebody's accountable for, for you know, getting those things across the finish line. Everybody knows what's going on. You've got the tools to, to make it work, and you've got the available data that you might need to train uh, a given uh, machine learning system. Um, number six, uh, rank them. Identify the POCs with the fastest provability and time to value. So the math that we'll use in this framework, it's very simple. It's just multiplying three uh, quantities. The goodness score is the dollar of the business processes impacted. Let me correct this here. Don't have my parentheses right. So the dollar of the business process impacted. So how, where are you making your dent? The, what is the benefit to cost ratio anticipated for this automation opportunity? And then multiply by a risk penalty. If this is going to be very risky, uh, there are gonna be ethical implications or the uh, you know handing over a credit score algorithm, for example, uh, to a machine learning instead of having it be transparent where you know what all the coefficients are and you know what all the factors are, that has a high risk factor associated with it. So that's an example of what I mean there. So when you put all that math together, uh, that will create kind of a, a indexed uh, score where you can then rank order and prioritize the various things. And so we'll walk through that um, in, in some examples. So what does success look like uh, for an AI inventory and AI roadmap. We just want to emerge with a handful of testable experiments that you can implement with a specific team in a three to six month time frame. If the measured ROI appears promising after this, you know, proof of concept three to six month time period, then you proceed with further implementation, rinse and repeat. So it's very iterative. You need to have an experimental mindset. You need to have an innovative, you know, like. You know, we're not afraid, afraid to fail, but you fail small. You know, that's why you have these bite-sized proofs of concept. So uh, let me pause there. Uh, are there any uh, thoughts or questions or, um, let's see here, I'm looking through the chat. Anything going on there? I'll ask one without typing it, if that's okay. Please do. Okay. So, um, I guess what I'm curious as to have you tried implementing this and, and is it working? So this is the first time that we've packaged it. It's kind of a distillation of some ad hoc conversations that we've had at prepare.ai with, with different, different folks, different organizations, different groups, as well as a lot of the uh, client relationships that we've developed uh, at the software company that I work at at capacity. And so Depending on where we are in the organization, you know, it, we might be with a, an educational higher ed uh, client working with their student success. And then we kind of do something like this where we get, here's all the opportunities, uh, here, here's all the processes, here are all the opportunities to impact them. Let's rank and categorize them and then we'll approach them uh, for the things that we can do in our software platform so we can automate uh, things with to do with emailing and with texting and with uh, questions and chatbots and those types of things. So what we're trying to do with this framework is take a step back and make even broader, uh, you know, autonomous vehicles, uh, computer vision systems, the, the whole universe uh, of opportunities. If you're sitting there in the, the C-suite at, at a company, you want to explore them all and have a, a, a high level general framework to, to uh, you know, set out your roadmap and prioritize those. So that's kind of, it's a distillation of a lot of piece parts, I guess, in short, to answer your question, Lorraine. Thank you so much. Definitely. You know, Dave, I, I also have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so whenever we're trying to rank order these, this is something I've ran into, is that it, it seems like one of the hard things is figuring out how much we should succumb to the current state of affairs, right? Like we have these legacy systems and should I consider a POC to need to be the ideal POC or should I allow it to kind of find its place in the current situation, you know, of the, the current, you know, if I'm using an on-premise database, do I need to move the data to the cloud or is it okay if I just 
pull it from there, you know, mm -hmm. or do I, you know, do I need to, um, you know, deploy it, deploy a model to where it's available in the way that we're going to want it to be available, or is it okay to write it back to a database because that's what everyone's used to? Like, yeah. th does that make sense? And that like, does make sense. Once yeah. I let that in, then how do I, like, how do, how does that factor in? Or is there, is there any like maybe insight that you have as to something that you can, you can help to get through to people or get them on the right page? Yeah. I mean, I think I would, I would order time as, as the, like, don't let, don't let perfect be the enemy of good uh, in that situation. Like time is probably your time to value is, is the, the highest uh, thing that you should be considering. I, I think in a situation like that, um, you know, if you wait to move things to the cloud and wait to do this or that, it's going to be a long time and it might not even work. So like, yeah, just do an offline batch analysis process. See like, Hey, can we, can we move the ball forward, increase the efficiency, increase the accuracy of the process, even while it's still on a mainframe or whatever. Um, and then, then go from there. Right. Cause if that, if that doesn't move the needle at all, then, okay. Like you don't necessarily need to move to the cloud then, but if it does, then you know, maybe moving the cloud will like double the, the ROI on that. So uh, yeah, I would, I would double down on speed, speed to provability and speed time to value. Um, cool. Good stuff. Um, so when we're, I just want to tee up this next section is when we're thinking about the company, when we're thinking about doing that, that inventory, you know, if we're talking to, to people at the business, they're going to know their business but they may not know uh, the, the automation opportunities that are available. And so that's why where, where you know, people like, like the people on this call maybe are more familiar than like, you know, a management, a typical management team. So this is where we, we would come in and we'd say, hey, here's our bag of tricks. And so we'd say to the, that management team, here's what you wanna be looking for. And so like to have a list of automation opportunities let me click through. Is it moving? Okay. So number one, there are opportunities in the RPA space, robotic process automation, things like form filling, uh, using a, doing mouse and keyboard actions automatically uh, with an algorithm. Things like data extraction, data entry, pulling things out of a form uh, with computer vision, optical character recognition, natural language processing, uh, things like sending messages and communication. So. One of, the, one of the important things to, to emphasize here is that like, this is not a machine learning, deep learning problem, but it has high business value. And so like, if you can set up an if then rule uh, or like sending messages to groups and like having the data of like which groups have which permissions, like that's just blocking and tackling software engineering. Uh, and there's no like deep learning there, but let's not like, you know, draw fences and like warden off those things because like this is this is automation. A person you can do set up a simple algorithm to do something so that a person no longer has to do it. That's the definition of automation. So like we want to consider all of those things in here because they're all very uh, contiguous uh, technologies. Uh, workflows, multi-process orchestration. So this is you know if, if you have a lot of uh, models running, a lot of predictions, a lot of if-then rules, a lot of, uh, you know, the, those algorithms, getting them to work together so that they're orchestrated, so that you have some logic and dependencies and like, hey, these things are over, but these things aren't, so I'm going to wait. And then when they're all done, now I'm going to go and do this. So those are all kind of RPA uh, tools in the toolkit. Number two, uh, in real life. So this is uh, IRL. This is like Internet of Things, sensors. This again. Uh, not all of these are going to be deep learning, machine learning, AI, hot topics, but they're going to be very, very cloud, very technology. Uh, so autonomous road car or truck, that's very uh, deep learning. You got the computer vision system moving a, uh, you know, a delivery truck around uh, autonomous aerial drone. Maybe you're surveying your property and uh, taking in images and looking for, uh, you know, power lines down or, uh, you know, farmland, your crops, you're, you're monitoring the, the growth rate of crops in various fields. Uh, so then autonomous assembly or a task robot, 
uh, you know, autom automotive factories have been using these for years. Um, they're, they're becoming more mainstream. They are, they are more accessible for manufacturing. Uh, autonomous factory vehicle. Uh, so, you know, like Amazon has in their warehouse, they've got these robots that are carrying shelves and shuttling them around to, to workers, uh, you know, things like that. Uh, and then finally, simulation or digital twins. Uh, do you want to, you know, this, I think this was really driven forward by uh, turbines, uh, gas turbines and, and jets and engines in, in that realm. Very expensive, highly sophisticated pieces of machinery. Uh, and then they would make a digital twin so they could say, hey, what if we changed the material of the, the turbine blade to this? Or what if we changed the thickness to that? So you can run all these simulations uh, in, in, uh, in the computer to benefit the real life. Um, so that's all the tangible physical stuff. Not all of it, of course, you know, I mean, like weigh in with comments if there are things here that I'm missing because I'm sure that's the case. Another area, and I think there are five of these. So three of five is natural language processing. Uh, so this is one that I'm probably most familiar with is the typed chatbot interface where you're, you're doing question answering, similarity search, sentiment detection, that type of thing in a chatbot situation. Uh, same thing applies with voice. Uh, it's almost, you know, almost nearly identical, but then you've got to just you know, translate uh, into the computer, into, into text language. And sometimes you don't even have to do that. Like there's a lot of new models now that I'm seeing where they're only working in audio uh, systems. So, you know, it, it never drops it down into, into a text format. It's just using the audio signal the whole time to classify, hey, is this person need to be routed to this person or that person? Interesting stuff. Search, question answering, uh, very important technology. Uh, generative text and writing. Uh, so this can, you know, tee up a news article or a press release, you know, things like that, generate marketing copy that can then be reviewed and uh, approved. Uh, translation, uh, you can ex potentially expand your business to uh, new global markets with a lot less friction due to some of the translation technologies that are now available. Uh, number four of five, CV, computer vision other things that you should be looking for uh, in your business opportunities to do object detection or classification. Uh, do you ever have, do you have people in your uh, business that are looking at things, inspecting things? Can they be augmented uh, using a computer vision system? Uh, facial recognition or identification, do you need to identify uh, individuals? Uh, or do you need to identify cows or pigs? Uh, you know, that, that they're using a lot of these uh, facial recognition algorithms in the uh, uh, animal husbandry space. Uh, fault detection. Is there a defect or a tumor or a threat? Are you, you know, looking through medical images, uh, you can use computer vision to uh, look for things like that. Uh, generative images and art, uh, similarly to language, you, there are models, uh, you know, AI models that will produce images, video, songs, art, all kinds of stuff. Uh, fifth uh, category of things to look out for, uh, automation opportunities, forecasting. You can forecast numbers in a time series. Uh, you can cluster or classify uh, items. So, you, you know, put a tag on uh, help desk questions, that type of thing. Um, predicting failure. And this would be like the credit score or a risk score or churn. Like, is a customer going to leave your subscription business? Um, so looking at all the aspects of, of uh, something and saying, hey, what's the prediction of failure? Uh, on the flip side, conversely, predict success. You can predict a purchase or a click-through rate or engagement and uh, you know, focus more resources on the more promising, um, your more promising users or customers. Uh, and then recommendation engines or personalization. If you have a lot of data about people and how they use products or what they prefer, uh, you can you know, make those customers uh, have a higher, higher ROI by giving them, uh, recommending things for them to do. And then finally, a few rules of thumb, which I find very helpful to keep in mind. Uh, the one second rule, as I mentioned earlier, if you look around your business and you see a, humans, a human is doing something, 
think about are they taking one second or less to do that and if so that is a prime candidate to to apply some automation and so if there's a uh you know security guard who's glancing at a camera feed to see if there's a threat like that's an area that computer vision could be applied is there somebody who's uh sorting things on an assembly line and take this and, and put it in that bucket and this and put it in that bucket that's an opportunity uh, for for potential automation. So anything that the human brain can handle in one second is something that a neural net uh, may be able to handle. Uh, when you get beyond that, that's where the current algorithms start to break down. If if you need to sit and like ponder about something and kind of like rotate ideas in your brain and be like, hey, what are we planning for our strategic plan? And you know, how do I draft this email and like make it string together into you know three separate points? Um, those are the kind of, you know, taking more than one second, that's the kind of complex cognition that um, the algorithms today really, really can't hack. Uh, the fuzzy cell rule, this is a, if you've got some math in a spreadsheet, like a sales forecast, uh, if you are putting in a value like, oh, you know, I think, you know, based on past history, 60% of our deals are going to close this month. Uh, that cell is an area where you probably want a model. Uh, to, to populate the value of that cell rather than kind of like, you know, putting your thumb in the air and be like, yeah, yeah, 60%. Uh, and then X marks the data. Uh, look for where your, your organization or company has data available. Uh, if you have a lot of user base or if you have a lot of history or a lot of order history, those are the places where uh, you can feed that data in to, uh, you know, level up on an AI uh, standpoint. So that's it, let's roll. Um, we did the poll, which company do we wanna talk through in, in the example? Uh, and let's look at those uh, results. I gotta hit escape, refresh here. So we had uh, to Dooley, we had Online U, Tesla, DoorDash, Electro Labs, and then it looks like several uh, votes for United Mortgage. So seems like the, the crowd has spoken. We'll go with United Mortgage. Um, so let's see. Let's go to an inventory and roadmap spreadsheet. So I have a spreadsheet here. Let's see how, what's the best way to move forward here? We want to Relevant automation opportunities, ranking them. Okay, so let's do, this is a text version of the slides that we just talked to. Let's do some math or something else over here. Um, do you guys ever do that? Just like a spreadsheet is like the best spot to like do. So I just like have random calculations on spreadsheets sometimes uh, if they're just sitting open on my desktop. Um, this is what we just walked through in the slides. So we've got our automation catalog here. Um, Pre-filled examples, I've got the different companies here. So our work in progress, 10, 12, let's go with, let's grab our United Mortgage here. So delete these guys. Okay, so the first thing, the first step is to outline the business processes. So break it down by department. Uh, we don't have to worry necessarily about the department ID. So this is, this is kind of like in a formal sense, you can like identify all these things. I'm gonna hide this guy, uh, hide the automation ID. But in thinking through, what a, what a mortgage company has. You've got loan officers, underwriters who are doing like the business analysis for those loan officers. What you're trying to do is you're trying to give mortgages to people. And so you're trying to find the people, connect with them, walk them through the process of, hey, here's a mortgage. The mortgage company is going to sell that to a bank or get some interest payments or, or you know, make the spread and the profit there. And they're gonna have this whole funnel to do customer service, uh, and, and find people with marketing, the website and the communication, 
And then you've got the back end support of facilities management, keeping the lights on, uh, IT for all of the, the workers. You've got a human resources department, and then you've got executive management doing financing, planning, business intelligence, analytics, that type of stuff. So this in a nutshell, these are like the departments that you would see at a mortgage company. And so this is, a, a, again, a spot where I would ask, hey, if there's stuff I'm missing here or th other things that you guys want to see, uh, you know, definitely put it in the chat or just, just chime in. Um, but these, this is kind of like the curated example of, of putting together what this business might look like before applying any automation opportunities. Now, oh, here, let me hide this process ID too. We don't really need that. So I've pre-populated this with the various processes. Like what are the, what are these departments trying to do? And so some of them have distinct ones. Um, let me go through this first. Can everybody see this? Maybe I'll zoom in a titch. Yeah, I can, I can read it. Uh, that's better. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Um, okay. So loan officers are collecting the loan documents. Underwriters are assessing the loan risk. Customer service, they're answering questions. They're routing issues to other people. Maybe questions need to go to the underwriters. Maybe some need to go to the loan officers. Uh, marketing website and communication, uh, they're generating new customer leads. So they're just trying to you know, fill the funnel, get people interested. Facilities management, they're keeping the lights on. Information technology, they're provisioning equipment, giving laptops and computers and printers and such. Uh, they're answering employee questions about that equipment. Human resources, they're recruiting new talent. Uh, they're trying to retain existing talent. And they're also answering employee questions. Uh, maybe there's some other functions here. Maybe they need to, you know, uh, survey. Maybe they have an employee, employee SAT survey. They need to report out to the, uh, the executive management team. Um, so that's, that's something that they're doing. Executive management and leadership, they're doing the planning, the budgets. They're analyzing industry trends, trying to keep ahead of things. Uh, so anything here that, that I'm missing, anything else that we want to add in that uh, folks might be doing? The last mitigation part, Jose, whenever, last they go to, yeah, whenever they go to foreclosure and things like that. What, that's a good point. Where would you put that? Do you think that's underwriters? I'll, I'll say it's, a, I don't know. <laughs> uh, that would be part of the underwriting, but, um, but it's, it's also, it could be its own department. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe we'll put it in here in distance uh, loss mitigation. Assess loan risk. Deal with foreclosures. That's a great point, John. What else? Anything else? My mortgage company has been <clears throat> trying to get me like crazy to redo, to refinance my mortgage. Because I haven't through all this. Well, it's a big story, but anyways, they're desperate, and so there's someone over there who like knows that I'm at risk to leave because my interest rate is too high. Yeah, so that's like kind of an analysis group. Maybe this is like identify, uh, refi, or churn opportunities. You know, I, I also would add one, um, you know, first to that point, I, I think that you might also be able to put that under marketing. Um, like I, I do data science in a marketing department and that's a lot of what I do is plan out, um, try to find out who's, who's going to churn or who, who we can intervene on to get them to do something else, you know, with a phone call or an email or whatever else, you know? So yeah. like, so I think that sometimes like, like, yeah, sometimes marketing is about bringing in new people, but you know, a lot of times you have like a loyalty program or something like that too, that, that has marketers really thinking about how do I retain customers? Cause it's cheaper to retain them than it is to find them in the first place. Yeah. Uh, but true. I, 
I, I would also add to that. Um, I think that there's room in this industry for intervening in ways that lower risk, you know, like there've been a lot of good studies about like, you know, doing the right things down the line, offering people the right opportunities to make it less likely that they foreclose, you know? So like, yes, get in the refinance. It makes me money, but it also might make them less risky because they're paying a lower amount. Yeah. Um, and, and also just, you know, you know, you see it with the car insurance and stuff like that. They, they send out a lot of information to try to help people to stay out of accidents, you know, or, or to stay out of situations where they'll have to give a payout, you yeah. know? And so um, I think that those, that there's a, a future in that kind of modeling where it's like, find my customers that need this information that need me to step in and make sure that they don't foreclose. I like that a lot, Anthony. Here's what I'm going to do. This is what we do at, at, at my company. We don't have a customer service. We have a customer success department. And I'm going to add that in here as that's uh, right. like, uh, let's see. So like nudge or, uh, bump customers to be more successful and loyal and profitable. Nice. Good stuff. Okay. So taking all that into account, maybe this is the right spot for these columns anyway. Now here, here's, here's a, a part of this whole framework that I think is pivotal is there, there are numbers for these, you know, you put together the budget and you'd say like, oh, it's 17.2% of the budget is in this department and 6.5% is in that department. I've tried to keep this simple so that you can do this in, in one session. You know, we don't want to like put a data request out to all the departments and come back six weeks later and lose momentum. So just like a one to five low to high, you can just, you can do low, medium, high. I think a one to five scale is like the right balance of like granularity versus simplicity. And so I've set this up so that, uh, you know, how are, how is the loan officer department? How do they impact revenue? Very high, right? They're the highest. They're bringing in all the revenue essentially. Uh, costs expended also very high, very high touch uh, job. You're you're ushering that through, and so you know th these are just you know my subjective ones. So this is, these are things that we can kind of bump up and down, you know, uh, based on based on thoughts of the group. Um, underwriting also a high impact to, to the business if they if they do a good job, the revenue is much better. It's much much less risky. The cost is a little bit lower. Customer success, they're very impactful to revenue. And, and, you know, based on what we just talked about, if they're going to be part of the loyalty and, and pr profitability, you know, I might say we bump that up to a five. Um, cost expended is a little bit lower. Marketing website, they're bringing everybody in. So impact on revenue is very high there. Uh, cost expended, you know, depending on where you're at, can change. Let's pause here, Oscar. You got a, a thought? Yeah, I have a question. So usually, I, I know you you mentioned that you had these numbers kind of like subjectively depending on you know the department and what you consider. But do you usually or do you ever run like actual calculations to see, yeah, like I guess to be more accurate with these scores? I think or you could. Does you usually just okay. I think you could, um, I would question the value of getting like too granular and too detailed in it. Okay. Uh, I think, you know, th there would be a threshold, I think, where you would cross into like anti-productivity where you would be arguing about like the second decimal point and trying to get too much data. Um, and I think the the point of, of getting this, um, is to just have like a first, like, like back of the envelope. We want to we want to walk away from this exercise with three, four, five proof of concept tests, uh, the best ones that we can pr prove going forward. And so I think at the end of at the end of each of those uh, proofs of concept, if you spend you know a, a very small amount of money 
to prove a concept at, and it's successful at the end of it, then you would do a more full blown uh, ROI calculation and like cr- dot all the I's and cross the T, all the T's. Cause then maybe you're, you know, maybe you spend, uh, you know, 50 or a hundred grand on a pilot. Uh, you prove the concept and then like, okay, if we're going to spend 3 million, 5 million, $10 million to implement a full solution, uh, you know, we really need to get it right. And we'll like zoom into like all the decimal points and, and do that. So that's, that's my first thought. Mileage may vary, you know, everyone is going to have a different situation. Um, but that's kind of where, where I land on that. It's a good question. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Lorraine, what's up? So I, I was just going to say that to me, when I look at this, um, in terms of revenue impact, it's kind of an emotional thing to rank these. But if you were to rank them in one, two, I think it looks like a seven or eight now, and say, who is most impactful on revenue and make them, you know, give them the highest number and take it down to the least, I think you would have, um, more rigor in your analysis. Yeah, I think the reason that I'm not doing a forced ranking here is because I'm going to multiply all these numbers by there, there's, I think, five columns where we're doing this ranking and multiplying them all together. And so I don't want the, the math to get too skewed. And so if, it, if it's a big opportunity, I want that math to be there. And if it's a small one, I want it to be there. But okay. I don't. Um, so I, I think that makes sense. There's, there's a, a lot of ways to slice and dice. Uh, but, for sure. You know, for me, I was looking at like executive management um, in most companies. I think they have the greatest impact on revenue. And um, so I was like, hmm, gee, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a subjective discussion for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, from my point of view, when I, well, yeah, when I put the three there, uh, my thought was that they're not, they're not directly attached to revenue like they every department here is going to argue hey we're contributing to revenue but it's just yeah it's so there's some subjectivity to it you know, it's not bulletproof this is this is a framework uh and so you know there's a lot of room for improvement uh so just thought i'd cool. include my two cents worth yeah no it's point well taken it's a great point um kind of to that point are you factoring in the impact from the lens of the AI opportunities, or is this independent of the opportunities? This is independent, and we'll do the the AI opportunities next, and they will be independent. And then you multiply them by each other, and then multiply them by an independent risk score, uh, and then that will give you kind of the composite score. It's a good question. Um, so let's see, facilities management—they don't have a lot of impact on revenue. They're not driving revenue. Uh, but there are costs, they're essential to the business, but they're just not driving revenue directly. So I, I put them at a one and they're kind of middle of the road cost, cost wise. IT, they're driving revenue at a three, maybe that's a two, maybe it's a four, who knows. Uh, cost expended as three. And I've got these gray ones under here just to, to mirror. So later, you know, it's a spoiler. There's two automation opportunities that I had for marketing. So they'll go, they'll go here. So don't worry about those gray ones. Uh, human resources, they're a three on the driving revenue and the two on the cost side, they're a smaller department. Uh, management, leadership, also a little smaller department. Uh, driving that, you know, maybe in a nod to Lorraine, we bumped that up to a four. Uh, you know, we could we go five. Uh, so what do folks think about this? Any, anything that we want to move around uh, up or down on the board here? I would think that the IT department might not have a lot of revenue impact, but they there are a lot of costs associated. I yep. think for four or five. That's a good point. Any other thoughts? All right, we can always come back. Um, so, okay, what was next here? What are the relevant automation opportunities? So, got another poll here. Turn that on and then I'll share the link in the slide or in the comments. So, and we don't, we don't have to like 
go crazy on this. I, I can just like show, I don't know, how, how are we doing on time, guys? Should I, should I expedite? I, I think we're fine. Um, yeah, I think it's a choose your own time. There's no, cool, cool. they're not kicking us out of the room at any point. So right on, right on. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's, let's see here. So what are the automation opportunities? Um, Can you put up your department listing again? Yeah. So, so yeah, so they would go in here and they would be like, you know, maybe facilities management they can automate with like a building control system, right? And so it's gonna have, get rid of this guy too. So relative to the, to the process, Get that guy off the page. Okay. We're going to want to evaluate each of these according to what's the benefit? Like, is this going to like change the world for that business process or just like, you know, move it up at one notch? So that's what I mean by low to high. So you can think about like, uh, you know, ac is accuracy going to go from up to the, the best possible? Maybe that's a five uh, or well, yeah, I don't know. It, this, this one's it's very subjective, right? Like a building control system is typically going to save five, 10, 15, 20% on energy costs, right? So like, I'd call that maybe a two. It's not gonna change the world. Uh, the cost of that is pretty low relative to the, you know, the cost of the building, maybe also a two. The risk associated with it to your business, very low. Not gonna do, I mean, Maybe, maybe there's going to be some like cold or hot pockets in the office that make people want to bring in a space heater or something. Uh, but you're going to conserve your energy. You're going to save, save some dollars, not going to spend a ton of money to do it. And the risk is going to be very low. So that's an example of, uh, you know, an automation opportunity for facilities management. I think uh, there's an opportunity for loan officers in automating the uh, the data on the loan docs and um, mm. pulling that in and maybe even doing some processing on that that would assess uh, based on uh, assess risks and um, let's see and and then you know kind of like a customer I don't know what you would call it but customer desirability yeah I think I think that what you're looking for too is like maybe uh, customer profiling that could be passed on to the underwriting and business analysis and like kind of like mining some some features that can then be put into some kind of risk model, which mm -hmm. I think would be in the underwriting section. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good point. So this might be like customer sellability predictions and. Uh, customer risk slash default slash credit score. Um, so what else are people populating this in here? Anything in the slides? Anything in the comments? So let me let me save these. There are another a number of them on the Slido um, page. You oh yeah. Them. Yeah, well, you weren't seeing them when you went there. So AI avatar to replace execs at meetings, sentiment analysis on the sales origination process. There you go. Nice. <laughs> uh, I like that. Get rid of the execs. I like it. Um, okay, let me do a little multi-tab craziness. I can't get rid of that. Uh, Zoom thing. All right. Yeah. Well, these are great. Let me let me paste in the example ones that I had. And we'll see where we're at there.
Free field examples. Da -da -da -da. Da -da -da -da. Okay, so I had credit risk predictive score. That's pretty similar. Intelligent document processing, CVOCR doc class classification. That's pretty similar. So let's just collapse those. Okay, so then chatbot, question answering, smart ticket routing was there for what department is this? Customer success. And then we got to add a new one for the one that you mentioned, Anthony. I think we need a new line for uh, nudging and bumping, nudge bump model. Nudge bump. These just apply weights from the thing above it. Customer sellability, automated lead scoring, that's kind of the same thing. This is their building control system. Okay, and then these we hadn't gotten to yet. So here's a consolidated view, what we were talking about. I'm gonna zoom out now a little bit because we're too. Not too many. Don't skip ahead to the colored sections. Don't want to get scooped on my own spreadsheet. Um, okay, see what else we have. AI avatar to replace exit meetings. Sentimental analysis on the sales origination process. That's, I think, similar to lead scoring. I'm gonna put that together. Chatbot, voice bot. So let's see, let's add that to chatbot, voice bot. That's a couple spots here. Hey, yeah, I mean, you can do that. That's, I mean, I don't wanna sound self-serving, but like you can put a chatbot in a lot of spots. And so like we do have, at capacity, we have a lot of clients doing uh in the hr and the it marketing external website communications and uh customer facing um so all those are good spots loan risk assessment we talked about credit score assessment those are those markedly different do we want to separate those out our ac automation that's what we talked about it Startup shutdown automation. So that's kind of like provisioning. That's kind of, this would be like an extension of employee onboarding. IT startup shutdown provisioning. So Jamf does that, right? That's a company that kind of does that exclusively for Apple stuff. Data extraction from the loan docs. We got that loss mitigation predictions pretty we may fall under foreclosure stages. Those are foreclosure stuff. It's kind of here. Okay. So any edits to that? That looks really good. It's rocking. Rocking, rocking. Okay, so we have not, we'll need to go through kind of like my scores here. So this we can look at independently. Um, so RPA and data extraction from the loan documents, intelligent document processing, computer vision, OCR, doc classification. That is going to be a very high uh, relative, that's going to be like the highest benefit I think that you can get like relative to the process. 
Uh, it's also going to be, I think, pretty costly. Maybe this could be a four or a three, but when you get into a project like this, there's just so much scoping and so many details to figure out. Um, in my experience, that it's going to be probably the high higher cost item as well um, to like set up that process. Uh, the risk, uh, it can, maybe this is higher, you know. Um, Oh yeah, signature verification to catch fraudulent tax. It's a good, good new idea. And those is the, the good one fight. Yeah. So let's see where would that go. It's probably in loss mitigation here. Yeah, my, my perspective on that is from a blockchain course I took where, you know, digitization of certainly documents, you know, need some sort of authentication, you know, and it has to be digital. So I think AI can help there. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, so let's see, risk default score. And maybe there's more risk here in uh, automating some of these. If you're processing somebody's loan application, that maybe is a little higher risk. Um, but it, it does have to go through underwriting. And then they do the, they review that, do the credit scores and all that. So that that I think is your highest risk. Like so, I put a five on that. Uh, the benefit to doing that I think is very high. The cost is lower because you can centralize things and it's not as not as messy as RPA and optical character recognition and pulling all the like random PDFs that are glued together and some are sideways and different forms and formats. Uh, signature verification. I think this is, uh, I think this is important, but the signature is a small part of all the data coming in. And so I might say that this would be a, maybe a three kind of middle of the road, like benefit cost is probably pretty low to, to do that. So my, my gut is that this is a three and a two or a three and a one. Um, please weigh in if, if that, that's any. Uh... I was just going to agree. I think signature verification, if you're looking specifically for fraudulent docs, the, um, the risk would be, the, or the, the risk is high. Maybe the cost to do it is low. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah. Uh, very low cost, like like you said, Dave. It's a small part, right, of the document, mm. and I think that. But I would rank rate the benefit higher. I don't know what others think. Simple but big impact kind of thing. I, honestly, I think that we're we're looking at the risk wrong. Is that I, I think that really it, it shields you from risk because whenever you don't identify a fraudulent, you know, doc, then it's actually a higher risk to you than it is when you do. So like. Even if that program is at all successful, um, but before you were more vulnerable because you you probably didn't have people that could pay attention to that level of detail, you know, or like you don't have a signature expert probably on staff, but like just being able to filter out a few people could save you, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's mm, a good point. It's exactly, and, and, you know, this is a great discussion. You know, all the kind of subjective things to that go into making a score like this. I would be and very annoyed if you say, flagged is, my signature is, is fraudulent, though. Yeah, yeah. To say these kind of discussions are not only the benefit of this type of group, but the benefit of having people, other people at work, to bounce ideas off of and to really, you know, kind of help flesh out ideas because you get different viewpoints, and when you do that, I think you de design better models. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, to, to Dan's point too, is I think that part of that is how you implement the process into your process, right? Is it, is it that it's flagged and then sent off to another thing before you indicate to the person, which I think would be a lot smarter than just denying somebody without, you know, it's more about narrowing it down. Like imagine yeah. if I had a, a system that said there's like a 95% chance that, you know, a kid in this image has scoliosis. Like I don't just diagnose them and then start treating them. Right. Like, that's a screening process. And then we, you know, like kind of like, then you go to, to do more fine grained look at it, but like, yeah. you know, you can't, you can't have that kind of, uh, 
it costs too much to put too much focus on everybody, you know, so you're trying to narrow down the pot and say like, these are the cases that were, that are worth taking a harder look at. But I, I think that your point's right, that if you just denied people, you'd, you would alienate a lot of, a lot more customers than you would, than it would be worth it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's, that's a good point. Like a meta point is that probably most automation opportunities need to have a well thought out human in the loop uh, strategy. How are you going to review, test, evaluate, and control, uh, you know, whatever algorithm you're, you're implementing? Um, so to play devil's advocate on this, like this risk, right? Like one thing that could happen here is that you don't set up a human in the loop. You start to trust the algorithm and then the algorithm drifts and, you know, it doesn't have the right data and people start using blue pens or they they move the signature block up here into a blind spot of the, the, you know, so then are you liable uh, as a company for all the decisions that the algorithm is now making? Uh, so that's where, you know, I mean, a lot of, a lot of different things can happen. So it's, it's worth, worth considering. Let's drop this down to a three, just for sake of argument. We keep, keep going um, with the, uh, with the exercise here. Uh, Chatbot. I think has a high, uh, especially in customer success. So I'm trying not to be self-serving here because my, you know, I work at a company that does chatbots. And so like, let's look at the chatbots altogether. So the chatbot for customer success, I said was a five, I had a very high benefit, but for marketing, I said was a three and where's the other chatbots? IT is a four, like you can really like, you know, get some efficiencies by having an automated answering system. And then for an HR space, I put it as a three, maybe even a two, like people want to talk to a human a lot of times. So, it, you know, it, mileage may vary. That's where I was putting the chatbot. And they're, they're relatively, you know, relative to the benefit that they have, they're cheap to implement. So I have them as two. Um, Maybe that's maybe that's a three, maybe it's a one. Depends on the use case. Um, so thoughts, pushback, additions on any of those. Just to clarify, is it relative to the benefit or relative to the? What, I, I, yeah, what's it relative to? I guess it's relative to the business process. Like, are you going to be spending? Yeah, like like a project in the customer success, is a chatbot going to be the biggest project that the customer success team has going? Maybe that should be higher. I don't know. Um, that's a good question. I would think, and this would possibly be harder because as you said, different departments have different budgets, but shouldn't they be relative to each other? like a three in one should be the same as a three in another, or would that, does that eliminate some of the differences or stop us from being able to, to consider the differences across departments? Yeah, I guess it's like, you know, maybe it goes with like signing authority, right. In a given department. So like, you know, maybe there's like two levels of like check writing in the underwriting loan officer and customer success these guys are like the big operations departments and like their vps can sign off on a million dollars uh and so maybe that's a five right for those departments but the marketing budget is smaller facilities is way smaller it like the vp can sign off on a hundred thousand dollars maybe that's a five in it like that's that's the sort of logic that i'm kind of trying to get at there and yeah, I understand that it's not, it's not like watertight, but there's some subjectivity to it. Does that, does that help? Does that make any sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And, and obviously, as you said, it's kind of complicated. Mm. This is good feedback, you know, going through this discussion. I'll see if I can put some more rigor around that. You know, maybe, maybe it's, maybe breaking this into two columns is, Maybe it should just be like the benefit one to five, um, getting like the benefit to the cost ratio. 
might be a little, a little much. I, I have a uh, comment. Uh, so I, I think this, I also find this exercise very valuable. And your, what you said about uh, at, at this level, like, like a human should be in charge in the loop. I would, I would say, you know, going through this, like owning this, I think that's very important. Because once it leaves here, at some point, it's good to go to programmers all over the world, and it's very hard to backtrack to this. Mm -hmm. Right? Am I, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Like process yeah. after this, what happens? Um, oh, well, I guess, so, I mean, each of these, I mean, the goal that we're working towards is to, like, select a few of these to say, hey, these are the three or four that we want to design a proof of concept, run a pilot on, and then, like, put some more details on. So yeah, I, I don't know that. Is that is that what you're asking, Faiz? Is I guess this is yeah a human process. This, mm -hmm. I wouldn't eliminate columns. I think I, I I like those columns as they are. I was even okay. thinking of adding a couple couple more. Okay. But yeah, ca capturing the you know um, impacts in a way that's usable and clear mm -hmm. is, is is useful. Awesome. Awesome um let's see so the nudge bump model let's see estimated automation benefit i think that's going to be three or four it's probably going to cost three similar to make another i mean the risk is i think pretty low on that you're not you're going to get sued for nudging somebody with an email um let's see are there any of the else that are controversial we can kind of just see where this lands with my filled in here i think this was maybe kind of a joke to get rid of execs but we can we can fill it out estimated benefit let's give it a three let's give it a five let's give it a five um, it, it was a half serious suggestion because if you could eliminate some of their travel costs and get them to be able to attend more meetings that would actually possibly be beneficial uh, okay so this is more like a telepresence type of thing well it was it was i, I was it was half serious that you know yeah. if you could really pull off something like that <laughs> right on yeah it cool. wasn't just zoom it was it was you know like basically cloning them a digital twin of an exec <laughs> right on. Cool. Very futuristic. Um, okay, so let's see where we're at. Uh, let's see, do we have everything here? I can fill in the math for some of these. So what I'm doing here, and I'll walk through it for the top one. If you recall the, the math that we talked about earlier, um, what was it on this slide? We're taking the goodness score is the, the product of three factors. How much of the business is being impacted in dollar value? What's the benefit to cost ratio anticipated from the op automation opportunity multiplied by a risk penalty? I'm gonna have to wait for that Zoom thing to move. Um, so the magnitude of the business dollars affected, I'm taking the sum of the revenue impact and the costs, uh, the costs expended in that given department. So, however big that department is, if it, you know, the loan officers have the biggest footprint of any department, and so the dollar value. If you can do something for that department, that's going to move your business the most. Uh, conversely, facilities, you've got a one on the revenue impact and a three on the costs. That is your lowest footprint. And so you should be spending the least amount of your time trying to automate them, you know, just to rank order and prioritize. Like there are great opportunities there. And if people want to champion them inside of that department, you know, definitely don't discourage that. Um, but that's kind, of, that's kind of where we're at. Let's see, to make sure that all those are populated. So then the benefit to cost ratio, this one's easy. You're just taking column J divided by column K to get like, you know, five divided by five is gonna be an even, even win. Uh, and then the risk factor, uh, this one's a little contrived. Uh, you know, I didn't want to penalize anybody more than 50%. So 
based on the one to five, I'm taking, you know, 11 minus the one to five score divided by 10. And so you get risk factor penalty multipliers of 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 or one. Yeah, no, the, yeah. If, if the risk is the lowest, if it's one, then you don't have a penalty. Does that make sense? And just multiply all those together and then uh, color code them. So let me make sure that we're populating all the fields. Get rid of these placeholders down here. Um, and let's, let's sort them up. Get our old filters in there. Slicer filter. Why is this? Why is this hard? It's usually a button. Yeah, there it is. Um, sort them. Actually, hang on. These are formulas relative to each other. Sort Z to A. All right. Far and away, we've got our, our signature verification. Oh, son of a gun, and we didn't, uh, let me unsort. I gotta reproduce the, uh, the blanks here. The problems of spreadsheets versus databases. Right, values, control shift V. It's a great hotkey if anybody's looking for Excel tips, Google Sheet tips. Okay, so our, our best opportunity is this signature verification, uh, given that it's, it's a big business opportunity. We have a three to one benefit to cost ratio, a moderate risk, our composite score then is coming out to be uh, 16. And so all of these are between 16 and one. And this is kind of the ranking that, you know, you, you want to get and look at. Now, this is not, you know, definitive, like this isn't like a mathematical proof, uh, but this is, this is directional based on all the discussion that we, we had prior. Um, so then you'll see putting a chat bot doing question answering in the customer success area. That score is number, number 12. How can I, oh yeah, here's what I'll do. Pow, let's just drag that over there. Um, or maybe here. What's next? IT doing some automated employee onboarding, process flow, provisioning, shutdown, uh, all of the equipment stuff. Uh, putting a chat bot or a voice bot, doing question answering in the IT space, and then doing a nudge or bump model in your customer success. So, you know, in a vacuum, if, if this were me, I'd say, hey, let's, let's test the top five opportunities uh, and draw up a lightweight proof of concept. Um, so we'll, we'll move to that next, but what thoughts or discussions, anything surprising on here to anybody? <laughs> Excuse me, what's, what's down at the bottom? Building control system, employee onboarding, process flow. Why is that? I guess it's just a middling benefit to cost ratio in a small area. I'm surprised Leeds isn't at the top. Uh, this guy here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that we gave it a two. So maybe, maybe the, well, okay, so yeah. This, this, what is the, what is, how much can you move the needle? on a lead score, like if somebody visits the website and you detect that they're from a, a hot real estate zip code or something, you know, whatever the signals are, are you going to, you know, spam them with a pop-up faster 
it, you know, like how, can, how much can you move the needle? Uh, yeah, on, on I guess where that. do most of the leads come from? I, do you do like partner with Zillow or something? I mean, potentially that would be a good way, but I don't, are you even going to trust a, a mortgage person that reaches out to you proactively, digitally, on phone, whatever? Yeah, so I guess I buy. Just, yeah. it seems like a good area to like impact revenue. You know, I, I think that it's, I would, I would say it's good that it picked up on, or that it, that it kept the risk scoring low, right? Is that that's one of the ones where you hear a lot of people jump in head first of those kinds of projects because it seems to be the central feature of the business. And we know it's the kind of thing that offers itself to modeling without remembering the high risk that's associated with automating processes like that. And, and also, you know, not even just directly to the bottom line, but to your reputation you know, because of, of like ethical concerns and whatever else that um, I think that, yeah, I think that it's good because, you know, this should be in the analysis. And it's the kind of thing that's easy to overlook when you're talking about it at a high level. Yeah. I no. think it's important uh, to have some type of, of uh, modeling whereby you, you come up with a composite score. I think that's very important because it's easy for people to get emotional about what should be done. But when you when you put down actual criteria, criteria and you set a value for them, you're much more likely to make a, a, a reasoned decision. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, I mean, any one of these numbers can be debated and have all kinds of questions around them. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe it, it would be better to do a one to three instead of a one to five and have less room for, uh, you know, all, all of the, you know, I mean, it, it's a useful exercise. I think even at this point, a management team might select, you know, this, 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 and this, right. But they know eyes wide open going in, like how they stack up. They've had the discussion of what the risks are. Maybe they say, oh, you know, the risk on, uh, where was it? The, the getting the credit risk score wrong. If that goes down to a four, then where'd it go? Well, it's still in the same spot. So it would, it would jump up. If we sorted them again, it would jump up to here. Uh, so, you know, that just, it just helps. It gives you a framework for the discussion. So, okay. So, so last step then is like, how do you execute on this? So say you pick the signature verification, uh, customer success chat bot, and this automate the uh, IT provisioning uh, and onboarding flow. You wanna do a lightweight proof of concept. You need to identify, uh, we, we use the DRI directly responsible individuals. Um, so who, who is gonna do that? And so, you know, maybe it's Lorraine and Jeff and who else is on here? Who should we pick on? And Uma. So identify maybe, well, let's see which one's more complicated. This one's going to be biggie, right? So let's put Uma and Jonas on this one. So you can have like the team that you want to identify specific people uh, that you know can, can execute these and then come up with like, you don't want to like boil the ocean, but like describe it a little bit. Say like, hey, signature verification. Let's let's use uh, uh, an Amazon API for computer vision and OCR, uh, and compare against maybe somebody has a packaged solution. Uh, let's call them Signa Signatureify or something. Dot com. So there's somebody like trying to sell you this, you know, do a bake off, you know, do the Amazon API, build an in-house one, uh, compare it against the signature FI, do a pilot, uh, and then say, you know, a five month time frame. You know, just like a little like paragraph to, to describe like what, what are we trying to do there? Uh, same thing, you know, 
you had a, a similar one for the, the chat bot and a similar one for this, just like a, a very small snippet. Uh, who, who's going to be tapped on the shoulder to, to run this? Uh, I guess I jumped ahead of myself here, for, you know, identify the tools, Amazon API and Signatureify. Um, what are your tools going to be for this chat bot? Uh, probably going to have to use capacity. <laughs> Let's see, what are you going to do for this? Maybe use Jamf to do this onboarding flow. Um, maybe some ServiceNow uh, or 1904 Labs, great vendor in town, Slalom. Uh, there's a lot of great consultancies and, and shops in town that can do a lot of this kind of stuff. Uh, object computing, a lot of them have sponsored our conference. So um, data. Uh, you know, you've got all kinds of, you know, identify your, maybe you want to use your 2019 uh, data warehouse of loan docs, uh, identify your data for, you know, all of these. I did scoot myself here. I was jumping ahead. So say I want to do this in five months. This one's going to take 12 months, but it's worth it. Which way, which one's the IP provisioning one? So let's do the 12 months there. And then the chat bot, like get that set up in two months, maybe evaluate over three months. So like now you've got a go plan for to pilot those things. Uh, and that's kind of like the end of this exercise. You don't really know much more beyond that, but to like, to sit in your business, have no automation stuff, have a framework to walk through high level, identify here here's some some places where we want to start uh you know that's kind of what we're aiming to do here and you know i think i think you can successfully walk away with a starting point uh after after doing that so i really appreciate everyone's uh contributions and thoughts let's uh let's discuss further any questions comments or, or thoughts on on that to ask you uh, uh, for contact information for getting hold of you. Oh yeah, let me see if there are any other slides going here. Da, da, are you gonna share that document? <laughs> gosh, I don't know. I, I I guess so. I mean, I think it's a really cool document. Yeah, and I think it's a great framework for thinking about this. It is. It's very helpful. Thank you. Um, I'd use it at work. That's good stuff. So would I. It's transferable. You can use it in other scenarios. It doesn't have to be necessarily AI efforts. Huh. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's a good point. You know, it's funny because capacity that kind of, um, yeah, hit me up with questions for sure. Um, oh yeah, it, the funny, it, it's interesting because in a former life, I did um, what, what are called uh, it's kind of like a, it's an energy study. It's called an energy efficiency potential study. And so you would similarly go through like, okay, where are all the places in the factory or on the campus where you can, where you're using energy? And that's like the, the size of the business. So that's column one. And then, okay, what are all the energy efficiency measures or opportunities that you can do? You can, you know, have a building management system or you can change all the lights from fluorescent to LED, or you can upgrade the efficiency of the furnace. So those are all your measures. Um, there wasn't really like a risk factor. It's, you know, the, all of the risk is kind of taken out. It's not as probabilistic as machine learning and AI. Uh, but then you'd multiply those together and kind of sum it all up and say like, hey, you, you know, if you invest a million dollars on your campus, you can save $400,000 in energy costs a year. And it's a two and a half year payback. Uh, and then after that, you're, you know, it's all, all gravy. Um, so it's kind of like a, it's a similar framework you just like item by item and it kind of like put it together in a in a, uh, a systematized view but that's the word it's very cool thank you for sharing i love it definitely thanks everyone for for attending and contributing you navigate so pretty nicely you. the oh sorry i was gonna say you navigate pretty nicely sorry to interrupt lorraine you can no, no. Finesse this spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah, and, yeah, that's yeah. Good. You know, I think we can all see that there's great value here. And, you know, it makes me want to go get more involved with Prepare AI. Awesome. 
Awesome. Yeah, we definitely welcome that. That'd be good stuff. Yeah, so. I, I would add too that I, I think it's good because it has a the way that we work through it. I don't know if it's always the same way, but that it allows a lot of contribution from different people because I feel like one of the one of the most difficult things is is having people feel like they contributed enough to where they still want to be a part of it by the end, you know, and like the fact that you can kind of like have multiple contributors and have little sub debate debates about the the value that you'll put somewhere like. I, I felt like I contributed enough to where I'd still want to be part of the project. Like if I were, you know, <laughs> you're going to have so many people. I think it's hard to get people to want to do these kinds of things whenever you have competing objectives in different departments and different people oh, that don't want to take true. on more work and stuff. But um, it does feel like a nice flow to get everybody to the end and still bought in, still want to want to do something. And, and also just, identifying who's going to do what i think it has the upshot of them being able to to then take credit for it later you know it's like if, yeah. if you don't if you don't do enough of that if you don't clarify yeah, was, who's responsible then you just you know it's like people that they, they constantly like talk I'm, about the work that they have to do um and and they're like i'm too busy to do yeah, the poc right yeah, yeah. Uh, you got to make yeah, sure it's their job right um and then they can then they can actually you know incorporate it into their normal work and and go back to their boss and say well you know I've got the POC that's my one of my big projects right now right yeah. so I think that that's also nice about it is that you, in the end of there we're really clear about who's allocating their time and and who's owning certain aspects of the project and stuff yeah that's a great point you know I I wonder maybe I should even put in here for like that ownership like you know who who whose idea you know so it, it you know because that would give people like the ownership like you're saying i think that's really important um cool i like that yeah i think you know i mean if any if anyone is interested in like doing this at their company uh, you know i would love to as prepare come and like help co-facilitate this if, if uh you know if, if that's an attractive idea to anyone um but, you know it's kind of the reason that I'm trying to get this out there to like flesh it out, get some feedback on the process and then like, see if we can start helping people, uh, you know, automate, automate their stuff. So. Yeah. I, I, I guess, do, do we have any more questions or are we good to go? I just really want to say thank you, Dave, for being here tonight, for sharing this with us. I, I think this has been very helpful and I really appreciate his willingness to, you know, stand up and share. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Dave. You gave me a lot of, uh, I'm right now working in a, uh, we're in the discovery part and you gave me a lot of ideas. So I'm going to steal a lot of this. Content. Um, thanks a lot. This is amazing. Excellent. Excellent. Great. Awesome. Well, I guess, uh, hope to see everybody next month. Good. Thanks, thanks for coming out, Dave. Bye. Take care. Bye.